Good morning. I know we're just a few. We can do better than that. But. Good, morning. good morning. I'll take it. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And as you can see, we have quite a few missing this morning. Some are sick. Some are on the road. Some are away from home this morning. So please pray for those. Are there any announcements? Next Sunday, 7.30, we have a charge conference. There will be a Zoom meeting, and I'll send the information to David, and he will get it out to everyone. I just wanted to thank everybody that helped with the crop walk. If you read your bulletin, we exceeded our goal by $500. Amen. Okay. We raised $2,200. And I don't know how we compare to the other churches, but I'm guessing we're the number two we have been for the last couple of years. So just keep up the great work. Thank you. I'd also like to thank those who agreed to step in the new positions of leadership for next year. We'll have a new PPRC chair and a new administrative council chair. And they are brand new at these positions, so at the beginning of the year, please, well, start praying for them now. They'll need it. Any others? Staff parish, Monday night. Yes. Fresh child, Tuesday morning. Any others? I just wanted to share, we will start now moving forward for probably a couple of weeks, collecting snacks for the fire department. Um, most of us are familiar, the some that came in were Mr. Jim, and we appreciate that. And just for keeping us safe and bringing the trucks over every time that we ask, and just the different things that they do for our community. And we just want to say thank you. So we can bring those and put them on the front row. Any others? Is it anything in particular? Anything. They'll eat anything. <laughs> yeah, I was getting ready to say, I've known a few firemen, they'll eat by anything. <laughs> anything else? Then let us please stand as the light of Christ enters our midst. You may be seated. I guess I should have had you stand. I saw where Charlotte was supposed to do our prelude. I thought maybe she had left something on, on tape or something. Guess not. Please stand again as you are able and join with me in singing hymn number 732. 732.
may be seated. We're lost without our choir director. <laughs> Absolutely lost. But we're here to worship the Lord anyway. Whether it be in song or the spoken word. Are there any joys or prayer concerns this morning? Any others? I would like to lift up Trooper and his family. They have COVID. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, we haven't been around them in several weeks, so we don't have to quarantine, but they seem to be doing okay. Any others? If you have an unspoken request that you would still like to give to God, let it be known by your sign of surrender. Lord, it's been another one of those weeks. But I know I didn't face it alone. And knowing this, I know that I can truly surrender all. Let us pray. Father, first of all, thank you for being who you are. You're God, our Father. And you are worthy of all our praises. You're the one who loves us more than Anyone loves us. You love us beyond comprehension. You love us so much that you sent your son, your only child, to pay our price so that we could be in relation with you. Out of your love for us, you, you have promised to be with us. You have promised to, to hear us when we call on you. And you have promised to move when we call on you. And Lord, we know that you answer every prayer. And we thank you for those answers, even if it's not the answer we want. But Lord, we thank you for that love, that, that grace, that undeserved love. We thank you for your mercy in not giving us what we deserve. We thank you for being that kind of Father. And Father, knowing this, we know that we can come to you with our petitions, with those who are sick, with COVID and, and whatever else is Bothering them, Lord, whatever Ill illness that they have, we know that we can bring it to you and you hear us and you will answer us. You will not sit idly by when your children cry out and do nothing. Lord, we leave those petitions with you. For those who are sick, for those who are depressed, for those who are lonely, for those who are lost. We leave those petitions with you. Now, Father, we leave those petitions with you and, and we claim them done by praying in the manner in which your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us reaffirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed, found page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, oh, I'm sorry, I keep. <laughs> I'm lost without him, I'm sorry, I, I really am. <laughs> they're my prompts, and they, they bless us so much, and I miss them, we miss them when they're not here. Stand as you're able as our tithes and offerings are brought forward. You don't know what music means to the service until you don't have it. Father, we thank you for this offering. We thank you for those who are able to give, and we ask that you bless the offering and the giver. But Lord, for those who are unable to give, we ask a double blessing upon them. And Lord, let this offering be used for the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout our community, throughout our country, and throughout our world. And let the church say, Are there any children? You may be seated. Should you be using a cell phone? No. If you're in school, should you be using a cell phone while the teacher's talking? No. No. If you're in church and you're supposed to be listening to the preacher, should you be using a cell phone? No. Okay. So you can use a cell phone anywhere as long as it's charged and as long as you have a reception or service. You may not really understand what that is, but as long as you've got service. Okay. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can always use your cell phone. You can talk to people, you can ask for directions, you can ask for help with lots and lots and lots of things, like how to spell something, or if you need to know what something is, all you have to do is ask your cell phone. You can use prayer just like a cell phone. Yeah, just like a cell phone. 
If you are lonely and want someone to talk to, all you have to do is talk to God through prayer. If you need directions and do not know uh, how to go or what to do, you can talk to God and ask him to direct you in what you should be doing. You can talk to God about what? Uh -huh. Anything. There is nothing that you can't talk to God about. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, you have to ask. You have to ask God to help you. You have to ask God questions. When you call someone on your cell phone, do you have to ask it or, or does it just call somebody on its own? No. No, you can't do it by itself. You have to, you have to go call Ronnie Newsom. Do you think it'll do that? You don't think so? No. Well, let's see. Do you think it'll do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, see? All I had to do was ask, and it did what I asked. Hello, Ann. What are you doing now? <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> all right, later. So all you have to do is ask the cell phone, and it'll do it. All you have to do is ask. It's the same way with God. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7. Ask. Uh, do the same with prayer. Ask God for what you need and trust Him to provide what you need. Now this doesn't mean that He's going to give you every single thing you ask for. I need a new toy now. Mm -mm. That's not what we mean. God will answer your prayers and provide you with what you need. With what you need. Food, water, clothing, someone to take care of you. God will provide you for what, with what you need. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these children. We love them so much. And we just want you to put your loving arms around them and protect them today and every single day. And we look forward to seeing them back next Sunday. In that I we pray. Amen. Give them to the preacher. Some of you may know her, Miss Becky Heilman. Come and bless us with what I am sure will be a beautiful, beautiful song. Good morning. It's an old song. What's so funny is my daughter Liz and I, when I practiced the song I was going to do 12 times, and she listens last night at bedtime and tells me to sing the one I have to practice. <laughs> but I did, I did go over it one time. But it's an oldie goldie, but it, it is a good song. And I thank you, Nancy, for asking me today. It's really an honor. It's really an honor.
Church. Will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministers? Your response is either I will or will not. I will. Congregation. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers? your presence, your gifts, and your service. I'm sorry, that was for me too. I will or will not. I will. Now, congregation, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We would give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our and witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. And let the church say, Welcome to our newest members, Ken and Angie Mendoza. We have a gift for you. We have a prayer shawl group here at the church, and this prayer shawl has been uh, crocheted, and it's been prayed over, and we want to give it to you, and you can put it around your shoulders or cover yourself anytime you feel like you need God's arms around you. And we also have one for you, Ken. We, we, uh, 
been praying that it worked, and we hope that you can feel God's arms around you when you use it. Thank you. So thank thank you. you. We're glad to have you. Okay, we want to if you would stand up. This is our membership secretary. I'm sure she will wish to speak with you sometime today, right here. God bless you and welcome to the family. Which you already done. I love doing that. What a blessing. What a blessing. Has anyone ever had one of those times, well, for most of us, one of those years and a half, where everything just falls apart? Well, that's the title of the message this morning, When Everything Falls Apart. Amos, yes, we're going to the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, Amos chapter 3, Verses 11 and 12. And these might be a couple of verses after we read it. You're like, huh? But hopefully after we're done today, you, you'll understand it a little better. Amos chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. When everything falls apart. Again, Amos chapter 3. Verses 11 through 12. As we are able, let us please stand at the reading of God's Word. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. The word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. During a transatlantic flight, the pilot came over the intercom and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be your pilot for this flight. I can tell you the flight is going well. Nevertheless, I have to tell you about a minor inconvenience that has occurred. Oh, it gets worse. The passengers on the right-hand side can, if they look out their window, see that the close, closest engine is vibrating. That shouldn't worry you, because the plane is, is equipped with four engines, and we are flying along at a smoothly at an acceptable altitude. And as long as you're looking out the right side, you might as well look at the other engine on that side. You will notice that it is glowing. Or more pricely, Precisely, I should say, burning. <laughs> that shouldn't worry you either. This plane is designed to fly with just two engines if necessary. And we are maintaining an acceptable altitude and speed. As long as we are looking outside the plane, those of you on the left-hand side shouldn't worry if you look out and notice that the, one of the engines that was supposed to be there is not there. It fell off 10 minutes ago. Yeah, me and my wife are going to get ready to fly to California. This ain't helping me at all. <laughs> Let me tell you that we're amazed that the plane is doing so well without it. However, I will call your attention to something a little more serious. Along the center aisle, all the way down the plane, a crack has appeared. Some of you, I suppose, are able to look through the crack and may even be able to see the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, those of you with very good eyesight may be able to notice a small lifeboat that has been thrown from the plane. Well, ladies.
ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to know that your captain will be keeping an eye on the progress of the plane from that lifeboat. <laughs> when everything falls apart. Now there might be some folks here today who feel like the passengers on that plane. Everything around you is just going to pieces. Everything's falling apart. Everywhere you look, things are falling apart. And it seems that you were, you were surely crash and burn. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe it's your career, your finances, your kids, your emotions, your health. Or maybe a pandemic. Sometimes life has a way of tearing us apart. If it seems that everything in your life is falling apart today, then you need to know something. You need to know that God is still in control. God has not fallen off of His throne. He's still there, still alive, and still in control. He still loves you, and He still has a plan for your life. Even though it feels like everything's falling apart. Even though we, we tend to think that when things are falling apart, God must have it in for us. And this, this is the same theology that, that Job had to deal with. Job's friends repeatedly told him that he must have done something wrong for his life to be falling apart the way that it was. Yet what neither Job or his friends recognized was that something was going on behind the scenes in heaven. And God was still in control. And that not only was he still in control, but that God would restore Job. That's something I want you to remember this morning, that God is a restorer. When things are falling apart, God can put our lives back together. Now we're given a, a great metaphor of how God restores us when life is falling apart in our Lesson this morning. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd saves or recovers from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites be saved. Those who sit in Samaria on the edge of their beds and in Damascus on their couches. Amos, the book of Amos, is one of the best books to look at because it's representative of the Old Testament minor prophets. He, along with other minor prophets, warned Israel over and over again that unless they changed their ways, God's judgment would sweep in like a fire and devour them. God had chosen Israel to be his very own people. He raised them up, took them by the hand, and led them out of slavery in Egypt. He fed them and provided for them for 40 years while they wandered in the wilderness. He provided a land flowing with milk and honey and drove out their enemies before them. He gave them a king when they clamored for a king. And he blessed their crops and increased their borders. But the people had a bad habit of turning away from God and worshiping idols. And God sent the prophets to warn them. Warn them repeatedly, but they refused to listen and they continued to worship idols. Finally, God reached his breaking point. And Amos prophesied that the Assyrians would invade the land and destroy it and take the people captive. And the destruction, it would be so severe that all that remained would be two leg bones and a piece of an ear. Now folks, we can learn a lot this morning from two leg bones and a piece of of an ear. I know it may not make any sense right now, but it, hopefully it will in a little bit. 
There's several important lessons we need to remember from this passage about when everything falls apart. The first thing I want us to remember that when everything falls apart, remember that God restores. Now, in ancient times, predators like lions and wolves would often attack the sheep. And all that was left were pieces of it. The pieces would be gathered by the shepherd and taken to the ship owner, the sheep owner, to account for the loss. Now here God depicts himself as the shepherd who recovers these two leg bones and pieces of an ear. God saying that Israel would be devastated, but they would not be devastated beyond recovery. They would not be devastated beyond restoration. God would start with two leg bones and a piece of an ear and restore Israel to blessing and favor. God's promise of restoration can also be found in Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Listen to it. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord. Who will do these things? Now, David's fallen tent is a reference to the Davidic line of kings. They had been wiped out. God said that even though Israel's torn apart and the house of David is overthrown, there's come a time when God will raise up a future king from this Davidic line. Now, I'm going to ask, does anyone know who we're talking about? This king who will restore things from the Davidic line. It's Christ Jesus himself. And he says that he will restore Israel's ruins and build her again. Though Israel was down. They were down to, to nothing. Everything was falling apart. But God is promising restoration. Maybe there are some lions in your life. Maybe they've attacked you and they, they've torn everything apart. Maybe your heart's been shattered into a thousand pieces by the assaults upon your family, your marriage, your finances, or maybe even your emotions. Maybe all that you have left today is two leg bones and a piece of an ear. If that describes your situation today, take heart. Because God is a restorer. I'm going to say that again. If that is your situation today, if you feel that all that is left of your life is two leg bones and a piece of an ear, take heart. For God is a restorer. He can take what is left of the pieces of your life and restore you to a place of blessing. And throughout the Bible, we see that God is a restorer. And one day, just one day, Job lost everything. His wealth, his children, and his health. He found himself lying in the dust, scraping his boils with broken pottery. Yet in the end, God restored him and blessed him with more than he had in the beginning. In 1 Samuel 30, David and his men returned from battle to find that their homes were burned and their wives and children had been taken captive. Then David's men began to speak of stoning him. They were planning to kill David. And David encouraged himself in the Lord and God told him to pursue, overtake, and recover all. David's wife and children were restored to him. And we all know the story of Peter and how he failed Jesus miserably by denying that he even knew him. But Jesus restored him and gave him a place of prominence and authority in the early church. As a matter of fact, Christ looked at him and said, Peter, upon you, upon this rock, I will build my church. This is a man that had denied Christ. 
But Jesus restored him. God is a restorer, folks. In the days of the prophet Joel, God sent an invasion of locusts to tear apart the land until Israel was left with nothing. Then God speaks through Joel to Israel. And he says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. My great army, which I sent among you. Now, while this prophecy of restoration was meant for Israel. Pardon me. It shows us the nature of God to restore. It is God's nature to restore. When we are broken, when things are falling apart around us, we need to remember that it is God's nature to restore. In my own life, I can testify that when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. I know what it's like to have predators hounding you all hours of the day. I know what it's like to have your home repossessed. I know what it's like to have an empty pantry and an empty refrigerator. Not knowing how in the world we were going to make it. Yet I also know what it's like to watch God move. I'm, I know what it's like to watch God restore. I know what it's like to have God reach down and bring us up out of nothing. So I can testify and let you know that when we are left with nothing, God is up to something. When everything is falling apart around you, when you, it seems like, well, you got nothing left. God is still in control and He can and will restore. He can restore all those things and make you a blessing. And I am sure that I am not the only one in this place today that has that kind of testimony. Things were tough when me and my wife first got married. That's when the pantry was bare. That's when the refrigerator was bare. That's when I fell in love with beans and bologna. <laughs> Sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you have, like, the, like we can say, have been there and done that. But look at you now. Has God not restored? Well, obviously he has. <laughs> God delights in restoration. I think sometimes we, we have the connotation of God as being a spiteful capricious deity who takes pleasure in making his children suffer. And I believe that this is the, the unsaved world's thought about God, that he is a spiteful, capricious deity who takes pleasure in seeing his children suffer. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. God longs to restore. God is glorified in the restoration of his people, in the writings of the Old Testament prophets. God mentions his coming judgment upon the people repeatedly. But every time judgment is mentioned, God also gives them a reason for hope. Israel would be chastened, but, but God would restore them each and every time. He never mentioned destruction and devastation without offering restoration. If everything is falling apart in your life, God can take what is left and restore you to a, just like he did Israel to a place of blessing and a place of favor in the eyes of God. And we need to know something this morning that sometimes it might get so bad that we think that God can't handle this situation. We need to realize that nothing is too hard for our God. He spoke this universe into existence. What makes you think he can't handle the little mess we get in? 
Nothing is too hard for God. Sometimes we might think, well, like I said, the problems are just too big. Sometimes we're tempted to think that these dire straits we find ourselves in are too much for God. When we are left with next to nothing, it's easy to start doubting God's goodness and maybe even doubting His power. But again, let me encourage you this morning, Mount Mitchell, and those that are watching at home, Sometimes I believe that God waits until we're down to nothing to show just how great His power really is and He shows just how He can restore us. God specializes in nothing. In Hebrews 11 and 3, He says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. In other words, God took nothing and made something. He specializes in nothing. He started with nothing and created this vast universe. So again, you can believe that when you are down to nothing, when your world is falling apart, God is up to something. The second thing I want to talk about this morning, when everything falls apart, remember that God remains. Now when a sheep was destroyed by a predator and only a, a few pieces of its body remained, the shepherd was still there to pick up the pieces. The flock moved on, but the shepherd remained. Folks, we have a shepherd that will never leave us, nor forsake us. Though our life might be shattered into a thousand pieces, God still remains. Everyone may leave us or move up, move on, but the shepherd of our soul will always be right there by our side. How many here has ever had fair weather friends that were there as long as everything was going good? I had friends that was, was there with me, but as soon as the money ran out, they did too. But we've also had those friends that were there through thick and thin. It didn't matter what you were going through. They remained. Well, Jesus said that he would stick with us closer than a brother. He will be right by our side regardless of what's going on. He never gives up on us. We might give up. Our friends and our family might give up. But God will never, ever give up. We have to be very careful in these times that we don't rely on our feelings. I'm going to say that again. Whenever we're in these bad times, whenever it feels like everything's falling apart around us, we need to realize and be careful that we don't rely on our feelings. Our feelings and emotions are unreliable. There are times when we're not going to sense that, that God is near. Well, I can't feel God. Things are so bad, I can't feel God. Where, where is He? But the Bible is clear. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is with us. This is why we are commanded to live by faith and not by sight. As many times as Israel rebelled against God and worshipped idols, God never gave up on them. Over and over again, He called to them through the prophets. Even when judgment finally arrived, God told Israel that despite invasion, defeat, utter destruction, and exile, He would still be with them. Folks, God will not disown nor divorce us. In Leviticus, He tells us, tells His people, yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject nor abhor them as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. 
I am the Lord. I want you to notice this morning that, that God said that he would not give up on his people, not because they were faithful, but because he is faithful. The Apostle Paul says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown us or disown himself. It is the Lord's integrity that is at stake. That is why he will never leave us. For the sake of His glory and His honor. What an amazing, faithful God that we serve. Sometimes I feel that God allows us to come to a place in life where, where everything is falling apart and nothing remains. Hoping that we will then seek Him. And discover that He is all that we really need. Through Amos. God said this. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile. And Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Each one of these places that I just mentioned were, were places of great spiritual importance. Bethel was where Jacob met God. Gilgal was where Joshua parted the Jordan and Israel entered into the promised land. And Beersheba was a place Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob encountered God. But now these places have become centers of idol worship. Here God is challenging Israel to consider their ways. Israel had abandoned God and sought idols. They had turned the heritage of Israel's spiritual history into centers of apostasy. Now God tells Israel if they will abandon their rebellion and seek Him, they will live. If you're here today and you're left with only pieces, you need to do some soul searching. Is it your own disobedience that has brought you to this place? Has your life fallen apart because you have been seeking all the wrong things and all the wrong places? That sounds like a country song. Has your focus been on the wrong matters? Have you worshipped the things of the world? Have you forgotten the spiritual heritage and abandoned the God of your fathers and your mothers? God's word to us today, whether you're here at home or wherever you may be, God's word to us today is to seek Him and live. Stop looking for deliverance from Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba. Instead, seek God and live. Life is found in no one other than Christ Jesus himself. When everything around you falls apart, remember, Christ remains. And the last thing I want to talk about. When everything falls apart, remember God redeems. Now the leg, how many were wondering why there was only a, a, two leg bones and a piece of an ear left? Here's why. Hopefully this will clear up some things. The leg bone below the knee of a lamb is dry. It's basically just skin and bone. Pretty much worthless. Even predators would usually eat, wouldn't usually eat the leg bones. Nothing there. But when the bones were left behind, the shepherd would still gather them into his arms because they were valuable to him. And they were valuable to the owner. Folks, God is the great shepherd who gathers the worthless bones of Israel and redeems them because they are valuable to him. From two leg bones and a piece of an ear, God would once again rebuild Israel. 
Amos says the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken. It will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter, by the one trending grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They, they will make gardens and eat their fruits. I will plant Israel in their own land. Never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Though all you may have left is some leg bones and a piece of an ear, you need to know that God can take what is worthless, what might be deemed as no value, and he can redeem it. When the fire sweeps through your life and leaves only ashes, God gathers the ashes and uses them to build something great. God has a way of using the foolish and the weak things of this world to confound the wise. When we put our bones in the hands of the Master, He takes what is worthless and does miracles through them. But the key is that we have to put our bones in the hands of the Master. We have to recognize that although we are left with only a little, that, that little is much when given to God. One day when the multitude were following Jesus and had nothing to eat, the disciples were frantic because the people were hungry and they had no food for them. And a young man came with those five loaves and, and two fish. Or, now remember, these were real small fish, and I like to say five biscuits and two sardines. But what was five loaves and two fishes among the multitude? But the young man put the loaves and the fish into the hands of Jesus. And Jesus took them, blessed them, and broke them, and the disciples fed more than 5,000. Not only were the multitudes fed, but there were 12 baskets left. Miracles happen when we put what the world and what we may even deem as worthless. These small worthless things, when we put them in the hands of Christ Jesus, miracles happen. In my hands, a golf club is worthless. I tried playing golf. It tested my faith. I hit more, I lost more balls in the woods and on top of the house and everywhere else. And so in my hands, a golf club is worthless. But in Jack Nicholas's hands, a golf club is 18 major championships. In my hands, an artistic paintbrush is worthless. I can barely color with crayons. But in the hands of Michelangelo, it is the Sistine Chapel. In my hands, a basketball is a brick. But in the hands of Bill Russell, it is 11 NBA championships. In my hands, a scalpel is just a way to cut my fingers off. Matter of fact, I was doing something yesterday and cut my finger. I can be clumsy at times. But a scalpel in the hands of Dr. Thomas Bashar of Duke University, it's life-saving. In my hands, two leg bones and a piece of an ear are worthless. But in God's hands, they are the building blocks of a new life. No matter where you are, where you've been, no matter what failures and mistakes that you've made in life, God can take what is left and redeem it. For something great. You may be low today. But God is getting ready to do something in your life. That will amaze you. God's not finished with us yet. Two leg bones and a piece of an ear. Is all you need to show to God. And see him move with power. In your life. So when. Everything around you is falling apart. Remember, God 
will restore. And let the church say. Please stand as you are able and join with me in singing hymn number 378. Amazing Grace. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And let the church say, if Ken and Angie, if they feel so inclined, would be at the back door to greet everyone. If you feel safe doing that. If not, that is fine as well. <laughs> 